Gang, are you looking for better sleep and relaxation, a relief from pain or anxiety without feeling totally drugged? Well, let me tell you about True Hemp Science Full Spectrum CBD products. True Hemp Science promises premium quality, pure ingredients, and true value. They source the highest grade organic hemp from around the world to handcraft the finest full spectrum CBD products in the Austin area and beyond. They offer a complete line of full spectrum CBD products, including oils, tinctures, skincare lotions, sports rubs, gummies, and chocolates. Gang, I've been using their products for a while now, and they've lowered my anxiety and given me incredibly restful sleep. How Did I Get Here has teamed up with True Hemp Science to bring you a very special offer that benefits all of us. Spend $100 or more at True Hemp Science, and they will include either the number 81 distillate, which is great for nighttime, or the number 23 distillate, which is great for daytime, with your order. And that is a $25 value. Just go to truehempscience.com backslash H-D-I-G-H. That's truehempscience.com backslash H-D-I-G-H. And balance your body and mind with True Hemp Science Full Spectrum CBD products. Let's get down. Hey gang, it's Johnny. I just want to take a second to talk to you guys about engagement. Right now, you're listening to the show, and I'm not sure exactly what platform you're listening to it on. But whatever platform you're listening to it on, you, you can subscribe to it and get an alert every time a new show drops, usually every Tuesday and every Friday. New shows every Tuesday and every Friday. Whatever platform you're listening on, be it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, Overcast, Stitcher, any platform, you can subscribe to it. And if you can leave a comment, leave a star, share it on your social media if it's something that you like, Please do that. We encourage you to do that. And also, as far as social media goes, you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I am at Johnny Gowdy on Instagram and Twitter. Give us a follow. Also, you can like our Facebook page. How did I get here? Please do. Anyway, all I want to say is you like a show, share it. Use the hashtag. How did I get here? Pod. We'll give you a shout out. Thank you so much for listening to the show and engage. Open my vault? Open your vault. <laughs> Once I open the vault, it ceases to be a vault. You have no choice. Wait, the vault. <laughs> Johnny, I'm your host, and welcome to another episode of How Did I Get Here from the Vault, where we reach back into our vault of a zillion episodes, pull one out just in case you missed it, just in case you want to hear it again, shine it up, and re-release it for you. Uh, Today, we're going back to episode 1086 that was released on August 20th, 2021 with James J. Y. Young, founding member of legendary rock band Styx. Yeah, baby, that's right, Styx. They were on the show. They had just released their album, Crash of the Crown, and they were heading out on tour. That's what was going on. It, listen, man, this was a weird one because I had gotten an email from uh, the publicist for Styx like back in May or April that said, hey, Styx is going on tour. If you want to interview somebody in Styx, let me know. And so I was like, hey, I'd like to interview James J. Y. Young. Or Tommy Shaw. And she was like, well, that's going to be a tough one. I'll get back to you. So uh, flash forward. I never heard back from her. Flash forward to August, like beginning of August. I was I tested positive for uh, for covid in the morning. And then later that afternoon, I get an email that says, hey, Johnny, sorry for the short notice. But JY is available tomorrow. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like, so here I am suffering from COVID, but I know you can't say like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do this right now. So I ended up doing this phone conversation with JY, uh, with James JY Young from Sticks while I had COVID. Um, so that was a weird part of the conversation. One sad thing is uh, we did this back in 2021. We had a conversation. We were talking about uh, what he does when he's not on the road. And, and most of the time he was taking care of his wife who was very ill. And sadly in 2022, she passed away. So, uh, you know, God bless James J.Y. Young and the dedication he had to his, his wife. And just, you know, there's a lot of love there. And you, you, you know, I don't know. I feel for the guy. I hope he's doing okay. I know Styx is going back out on the road uh, this year, 2023, and doing some giant tour again. So uh, get out there to StixWorld.com. Find out when they're coming to a town near you. And enjoy my conversation with this legendary rock star, 
James J.Y. Young, founding member of legendary American rock band Styx. Let's get down. How did I get here from the vault? Styx. Okay, so my experience with Styx goes, goes like this. I probably heard Lady on the radio, right? Probably. I don't know. I'm sure I did. But then Come Sail Away came out when I was like eight or nine or something. That song exploded my head, bro. Like that, like when, that, that was my jam. I got the record, The Grand Illusion. Got into, uh, I got into James J.Y. Young's song, uh, Miss America, at that age. Like that was my other favorite song on the record, which is really cool. Anyway, I talked to him about that too. Because I also believe, after listening to that song as an adult and kind of like going through the Sticks catalog in preparation for this, it may, maybe it was the COVID and hallucinations. But when you listen to Miss America... It sounds like the prototype of, of, a, of, a, uh, of an Iron Maiden song, really. Like the riff and everything, if you sped it up and stuff, it just kind of has that feeling. Anyway, so I, I got into Styx, and then they were, they were a band that I, I, one of my favorite bands at the time. And I really connected with James J.Y. Young, because at that point, like, you didn't have MTV yet or anything like that. You could, you, you could only see these people, like, in magazines and their, and their band photos and stuff. And James always was kind of, like, making a face. He, you know, he had this sort of, like, he looked taller than everyone. He kind of seemed like he was the guy, you know? And, and you know, kind of became, him and Tommy were always my favorite guys. I love Tommy Shaw, too. Tommy Shaw's amazing. My favorite stick song in the world is uh, Too Much Time on My Hands. I love that song. Anyway, so that's my, my experience with Sticks is that. And then in, uh, in, when, when I got in junior high, I became friends with this guy who doesn't even know that I did this podcast until I send it to him when it comes out. Uh, my friend Craig, and he, he had been living in Chicago, and Sticks is from Chicago, and he was very into Sticks, and, and, and Parad- uh, uh, Paradise Theater album had come out, and, uh, and we used to jam that. And I know that Craig Schilling, one of his favorite bands, was Sticks when we were growing up, and I know he still loves them so much. Anyway... So I'm excited for him to hear this. Craig, this is for you, baby. Um, anyway, so then, then, then Mr. Roboto came out and, and Don't Let It End. And while I liked Mr. Roboto, I remember, because I was like in eighth grade when it came out, I liked it. Then Don't Let It End came out, and it kind of, uh, that one, you know, it kind of lost me. It was a little like soft rock for me at the time. I was in eighth grade for crying out loud. Come on. Anyway. So, uh, you know the story of Sticks. You know that Dennis D. Young hasn't been in the band in over 20 years. Uh, but this guy, Lawrence Gowan, has come in, and he's really fantastic. There's a guy, I think, that lives here. That's their drummer, uh, Todd Zuckerman. Fantastic drummer. Amazing drummer. I think he just won, like, drummer of the year, like, prog drummer of the year. Uh, this Crash of the Crown record came out in June, and it was produced by Will Eb. Ivankovic, Evan- sorry, uh, that who is now in the band too, and, and this record is fucking great. It's probably their most prog record too that I've ever heard, and uh, and 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 JY and I talk about that too. Anyway, how exciting that I got to talk to James JY Young. Imagine those of you who are my age that grew up with Sticks. Imagine your phone rings, and the the thing the thing that comes up is James Young. Like that's the name comes up on your phone, and you're like, oh god, he's calling me. You answer the phone. And he's like, Johnny G, it's great. It's great. James J.Y. Young. I love talking to him. I love Sticks. Uh, find them at sticksworld.com. Check out this record, Crash of the Crown. They're all actually also on tour. They will be in Austin on Saturday, October 23rd at the Nutty Brown Amphitheater. It's a little bit outside of Austin, but that's a great place to see a show. Safe, outside. And uh, Sunday, October 24th, they'll be at Floors Country Store. Out there, outside of San Antonio. They're playing some cool places, Ben. I love Nutty Brown Amphitheater. Anyway, I'm not going to keep you from this conversation any longer. Uh, once again, it, it, it was a setup thing, and these things are like 30 minutes. They're set. It's not just me and him grooving out. You know, we're doing an actual interview, and it only lasts, uh, you know, 30 minutes. So, so that's kind of sad about it. I wish he would have come to my house and we would have hung out. But it was very cool having him call me on the phone. It was very exciting. This is all very exciting for me. I got to be honest with you. Six fans, thank you for listening. I hope I don't, uh, I, I hope that it's a conversation you can get into. So, without further ado, let's talk to founding member of Styx, James J.Y. Young. Let's get down.
young. Hello. Johnny G. Yeah, hi, James. How you doing? James Y. here. I'm good. I'm good. Good. Just did uh, 30 minutes with uh, uh, another person, and uh, now I'm going to talk to you. Great. Um, how is the tour going so far? I would say, considering, uh, you know, everything that's going on in the, in the world with the viral infections and this and that and the other thing, it's going pretty darn well. Yeah. Yeah, I got to see some... Uh... Some footage from some shows from a few days ago. I guess that's the blessing and the curse of nowadays, isn't it? Whatever you're oh, doing. Yeah, everybody's got a, every, there's a video camera wherever you go. Yeah, yeah. And you have Somebody's got it in their wallet or their purse. Right, yeah. exactly. Dude, let me ask you this, because I'm, I'm a musician as well, and I've been playing since I was 14 in the early 80s. And by the way, you've been a huge inspiration for me, and, uh, and I'm a huge fan of yours. Not just the Appreciate band, but that. of yours personally. I, I think you've always been like one of the coolest dudes in rock. Well, um, I uh, heavily influenced by Jimi Hendrix, who I saw play five times. And I saw the Who play. I don't know if you've ever seen this Monterey Pop yeah. um, festival where they smash all their gear and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And uh, I, I saw them two weeks later when I was 17 years old come to Chicago for the first time. And Townsend, he had a real hard time breaking that Stratocaster that night. Um, but I was, we were about five feet away from him. So, I mean, I saw I saw the big guys that we just sort of were heavily, I mean, Hendrix and the Who, my, I saw a teenager. And um, a lot of other people didn't, didn't, maybe didn't even know it existed because it wasn't getting a lot of play on popular radio. There were sort of the... At the end of the dial, there was the real cutting edge rock station that was picking up on the Hendrix and the Who and things like that. But uh, it, was, it was hard to find anything. It was mostly top forty stuff and and uh, fifty thousand a watt clear channel, uh, top forty stations blasting all over the country. But um, yeah, and uh, come from a musical family. Uh, I had two older sisters, uh, and then my aunt was a church organist, and my dad could could really <laughs> couldn't read music well. Either can I, but but he could hear a melody, he could play it, and I'm, I had that same gift that I inherited from him. Yeah, but rock and roll, and uh, I had I, my mother said, "Why don't you go take lessons from somebody else?" And I, because I, I did not take very many guitar lessons, the stuff was being invented, but some, you know, wasn't being taught, and I don't know how you would teach it. But this guy was like a British guy that came over, uh, late sixties. We're talking about, and he had, he looked like. He wore his beetle boots. He had a you know beetle haircut, even though he's playing jazz. And I think that was uh, his way of uh, meeting American young females. Right. But he, he he would tell me stories about England and this and that. He talked about the Who. And he said, "Oh, James, are crazy bastard. You know, you do, you don't want to do anything like that." And, I, and I'm sitting there thinking, "Yes, I do." <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sorry, course. Bill Davis, but uh, if you're still alive. <laughs> so, um, what's the guy's name? That's his name. So that that's where the that's where your love of the Stratocaster comes from. Well, Hendrix definitely, absolutely. Because yeah. um, before that, it was it seemed like it was like you see Buck Owens and it's a bunch of rockabilly and this and that and the other thing, and then the Strat has got a beautiful sound for that that kind of country countrified, you know, up up tempo stuff. It, it's Got its great sound, but Hendrix put distortion devices on and all kinds of other stuff. And and the Whammy Bar was uh, those guys would, would, would rarely use it, but he was he, he was on every song almost. And uh, it just uh, you know it was it was a time. I mean, everything cha- change is the only constant in the world. Yeah, is the way I like to put it. Um, because whatever you you think is, is rock solid, never going to change today. Wait a couple of years, and you will be shocked. Yeah. Particularly if you invested in something, you think he's going to go to the, to the moon, and maybe if he went to the moon, he's already going to the moon already, and it's headed, headed back down to Earth. Yeah. And uh, you got to crash your bank account and everything else that you put into it. So, um, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say that, that um, like, with all that you guys have been through as a band, success wise and, uh, and record wise and everything, it must feel, you must feel some sort of indication to release a record in 2021, this uh, record, Crash of the Crown, which, by the way, is great, 
and have it debut at number one on Billboard rock albums? Well, it's, um, you know, the, all those things kind of have some significance, but I really stopped paying attention to them a long time ago. It, it, it's, it's like we, we create, uh, and we do our best to, to do great things that please us and, and that we, we know what our audience is. Not that we're going to bend to them. We're hoping you know, they're going to, you know, open their brains a little bit more. We'll come at them with us from a slightly different angle. And, and as long as those, those recognizable harmony vocals are there and, uh, I hear Tommy Shaw's voice or my voice, or in this case now Lawrence's voice. Right, right. Uh, they've gotten used to him. It, uh, you know, it's, it's, you have to, you know, you have to sort of remain true to your roots on one level, but you have to sort of keep nudging that envelope out a little bit. Yeah. And, and I think Crash of the Crown is is that. It's a little, lot more prog than anything we've done in a long time. Definitely, yeah. And uh, uh, and I'm not, you know, I, I, we have loved the band, yes. Had a chance to, uh, I, I saw them early on in their original incarnation. Uh, we loved the first record they did, and... Um, and ultimately, they wound up opening for us yeah. uh, maybe about five years ago. And uh, Chris Squire, the bass player, who I was thought was one of the greatest bass players on the planet. Definitely. Um, that, that, that guy's, that guy's his, his bone structure is about twice as, as thick as mine. They gave me a high five, <laughs> meaning he tore my wrist off. <laughs> but uh, it, uh, no, it's, uh, I don't know. Yeah, so it's, it's all good. All good. Well, it's interesting to to get to this record, and and it does open up with like this this sprawling piece of music that's not easy. So it puts it in that prog territory. But then, as soon as it stops, that song, uh, "The Fight of Our Lives," it stops, and you guys have that acapella moment, and you're like, "Oh, there's sticks." <laughs> that's sticks. Like yeah, exactly sticks. Voices. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing to have that sort of identifiable thing. And the other thing too, I was thinking about like with with the with the timeline that you guys were on, and when people go through through the ups and downs and the crests and troughs of this uh, of this industry, you guys really stayed true to what your sound was. It's not like you guys ever went and wrote songs with like Diane Warren or anything. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I mean Diane Warren is great at writing hit singles, and a lot of people, you know, have uh, you know been launched to success. Um, I mean, because someone can have a great voice, but if they don't have great material, original material to, to go with, then they're, you know, they're not going to distinguish themselves and, and have a career. Um, and don't get me wrong, Diane Warren is a phenomenal songwriter, phenomenal. but we've never had to re- resort to that. Right. You- and uh, and we, we stick to what we do, and uh, we, we may never have a top 10 hit single, but we were making great music and as a big audience. And I don't know, I, I, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll talk for another, but I really have kind of achieved everything I set out to do as a young man when I picked up guitar at age 14. And, um, it's just, it's, I look back on it and I go, it's kind of hard to believe that we did all that. Yeah. Uh, but it was just kind of, there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of needing to be at the right place at the right time with the right stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we were there. If we had been, I mean, like the band Kansas, we're dear friends with those guys. We did a lot of shows with them on the road. And they were, they were from, you know, Topeka, Kansas, which is not, there's no major recording studios there. There's no record industry. Or Chicago had been the center of the jazz movement back, you know, in the 30s, 100, almost 100 years ago. But there was there was a tradition of Chicago music, Chicago blues, um, Chicago jazz, and Chicago rock was was uh, you know going back to those days. It was like uh, the crying shame and the American breed. Bend me, shame me any way you want me. Uh, those those were you know those were hit singles for the the fifties or for the sixties. And um, but we we wanted to go on from there and sort of we were much more of a British. Influence, and that's because of the Beatles, yeah, and uh, and because of bands like Yes putting out records, and and for me, the Who, obviously, and Hendrix. So, um, I don't know. We just kind of took our own influences. We do what we do, and it's it's sounding very prog at this point. Yeah, but uh, we have the we have the the musicians capable of 
of doing it justice in a live setting and then maybe even taking it to another level in a live setting, depending on how the energy of the crowd is and everything. And uh, so I don't know. I'm, uh, as I look back on our almost 50 years of recording career, uh, we signed the recording contract. First one, forgive me if I've said this already, but uh, February 22nd, 1972. And coming up this next February, the 50 years on 222.22. Wow. Wow, man. <laughs> you are entering the twilight zone. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, man, can you, can you get it? When did well, we're you, not there yet. No, not yet, but you, you will be. Um, uh, tell me a little bit about when, when did you guys make Crash of the Crown? Was that on, did you do that during the pandemic? Did you record it remotely? How did you, how were you guys able to do this, make this record? Well, um, Tommy and uh, Will Vankovich, who produced the record and uh, co-wrote stuff with Tommy. Um, uh, Tommy had actually met Will when he was in uh, when Tommy was in Damn Yankees. He was like you know a uh, of Jack Blade and a writer, right? And a guy that had been in you know bands, um, lesser bands here and there. And uh, but Tommy just really enjoyed writing with Will, and he actually sort of helped him financially to, to be able to move to Nashville and get involved in the Nashville scene there, being the good writer that he is. And then those guys started writing, and then Lawrence had been writing separately. And uh, and I was I was taking a vacation. Uh, but all of a sudden, I get a call from the clear blue, uh, J.Y., we need you to come down here and play some guitar and sing on this record. I said, okay. I went down there uh, two, two or three different times and uh, played guitar, you know, do your JY thing here, do your JY thing there. Um, and, uh, and what have you. And, uh, so it really was, it was really a, Tommy Shaw has too much time on my hands. He's, he's a guy that he will, he doesn't like to sit still. Yeah. And so he's always, he's always going. He's got a, he's got a, a motor that runs high. Yeah. And, uh, mine doesn't run nearly that high. <laughs> on stage, yes, but off stage, uh, no, thank you. Uh, but he, he's, I mean, he's, Tommy Shaw, he's, he's a rock star. He's an amazing creative force. He's a great human being. And uh, so he, I mean, he, he's the genesis of making this happen. And uh, Will is at his side, and Lawrence came in. And, and Lawrence is also a force of nature, a superstar in Canada. Never quite got the context of six. He is making his mark certainly right. in the American scene. And uh, those three guys kind of, you know, did the writing and, uh, and they decided J.Y.'s playing here, J.Y.'s playing there, and we need J.Y. here, we need J.Y. there, we need his voice here, we need his voice on the harmonies because I've always, I've been part of the six harmonies from day one. So. Yeah. And those are just, the, 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 the sound of the sticks harmony is made up of, of just three voices, right? Maybe doubled or tripled or something. Well, t- typically on records, you like to double the voices. It just kind of adds to the force of the whole thing. Right. But seeing um, you guys, seeing you, you guys, do that. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, I, what I was going to say is like seeing live stuff of you guys, it's it's still, it's it's just amazing because it's just three, is it three or four of you singing on stage right now, like live, like last night? Uh, I think uh, Will is, is singing parts of the harmony that I'm singing parts. I mean, and Tommy and Lawrence clearly are there. It's um, it's just so, so definable. I mean, sometimes, sometimes. Uh, I'm sorry, I talked over your question. Oh no, I'm sorry. Say it's it it's just so definable that, like, when you hear it, it really, like, really focusing in on it. It was getting it to the point where I was getting like goosebumps from it. Where I was like, "Wow, they just they sound like them, no matter what they do." And your voices have all held up, you know, throughout time. Well, my voice, I think, is is a unique. Because I don't really have a sweet voice, I just have a really strong voice, and then Tommy's got a certain sweetness and uh, to, to his voice. And Lawrence has got like this high, right. really high. So, you know, I mean, a lot, a lot of the bands, like even Three Dog Night, going back to the uh, sort of the and the Beatles. Yeah, you know, sometimes you wind up up in a range where you have a female singing, but you got a man singing up there, right? And uh, Lawrence has got that kind of high voice that, that most men don't have, and so he gives really is great on those. 
and I have just got a forceful, forceful upper mid range in my voice, but I can also do the real low stuff. And uh, so it, it, it is what it is, and you know, I mean, like any sports team, you look at the talent of your personnel and you try and you know mix that into a, a potion that's going to really work and. It takes a lot of experimentation. Sometimes you, you, you lay down the tracks and go, that sucks. Yeah. That, there, that can be a lot better or whatever. And uh, I, could, I could sing that better or, or we should, we, you should sing that part and I should sing the other part kind of a thing. But that's the beauty in the studio. You can use it with multi-track recording. I'm like, what it was back in the, you know, yeah. in, the, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and we're able to, you know, sort of play games with it and, and move things around and try different things. So um, it's not, I mean, that sound is the sound of my voice. My voice has always been there. Yeah. And uh, and Tommy's voice has almost always been there. Yeah. And Lawrence Lawrence is perfect because he, I mean, what John Strzelewski brought with the really high voice, he sang the high part on Lady. I was the the middle part and Dennis was on the melody a little bit lower, but we're all men singing strong. Yeah, and and and, and getting high, so um, was crashing cymbals and guitars. Yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna let me get a, get a sip of water here. I'm getting a little dry. Sure. Okay. Okay. So uh, there was something that was happening last night. I was listening to Miss America, and then I saw a live version on YouTube. And okay. I'm going to ask, do you, have you ever thought that that song might have been the prototype for Iron Maiden? Because <laughs> like the riff of that song predates Iron Maiden, and Iron Maiden sounds like that riff sped up. Um, you know, I, um, I haven't spent a lot of time listening to Iron Maiden. Uh, um, I don't, I don't uh, know if I have either, but that's like when I was listening to it, I was like, oh, wow, this really has like this sort of the gallop and the, you know, like all, all sort of the characteristics of what Iron Maiden defined their sort of guitar thing on. And I was like, wow, this is, I think this is like a, kind of the first song that ever really sounded like this. You know, I, I can't speak for Iron Maiden. No. I, what I do know is the first time we played England, which was in late 1977, that Joe Elliott and and Phil and, and a bunch of the guys uh, from De- Leopard were in the audience to see us when we played Sheffield, England for the first time. I mean, that was, uh, seven, maybe it was 78. And they were all in the audience. So when we finally worked with those guys, and of course they've, they've <laughs> overshadowed us in terms of how many records they've sold and whatever. Uh and uh, this, you know, makes it a little more true to where they were, where we've changed, you know, changed lineups a bit. Yeah. But, uh, and I know, I, mean, I think Leopard was definitely influenced by us. Yeah, uh, definitely. Made, and I, I don't know them well enough uh, to, to to really, you know, make you know to make a, a judgment about it. So I might have been the first guy that ever said that to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, I mean, I, I, I love I love heavy metal. Uh, and that's always my favorite song. I mean, it doesn't unless it gets us really, you know. Uh, but just the power of, of metallic sounding guitars with, with thundering bass and thundering drums and yeah. the big voices that that's uh, that's something that uh, gets my attention. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, and we so I kind of lifted uh, you know that and, and put it in the, in the context of what we were doing back in the late sixties. Sorry, late. And the recording contract in '72, so in the '70s, right. and uh, and the, maybe it wasn't a complete thought, but I think you know what I was driving. Yeah, at. yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I want to ask you this: for a guy that's been on tour for almost 50 years, what was that like when everything stopped <laughs> for you, like in 2020? Um, How did you deal with it? Well, uh, you know, it was. You know, I, I guess I'm enough of a historian to know that nothing goes on forever, and there's always something that comes out of left field or from behind you that you don't you don't foresee. Uh, but but 
there's been an ebb and flow to a lot of different careers with, with music people, with, certainly with film actors, uh, where they're they're hot they're hot for ten years and then they disappear and then all of a sudden they get brought back in a different context and it's right it's that and and for, and for me honestly, um, I've been married to the same woman since 1972, and she had some, some illness problems Absolutely. here and there and. Uh, uh, she had a stroke actually now about 12, 15 years ago. And, and so, you know, it was always difficult for me to leave her side to go do this, but, um, she, she encouraged me to go and she's, she recovered pretty well from it. Um, that's good. Probably never have any use of her, of her right arm. She was a righty, but she's, you know, she's a, she's adapted to being left lefty. And, uh, and she was as highly motivated as I am. She was, uh, <laughs> she she hated going downtown to work, and I just said, "You don't have to go to work. Just stay here and be beautiful for me, and take care of me." And 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 she, I I have no sense of what what to wear and wardrobe, but she like I don't kind of learn from her. But she's she's responsible for all the way the way I look, the way I dress, because um, she's she doesn't have a great sense of that. Yeah, she has a great sense of a lot of things that I'm lacking as a man. Uh, my grandfather started as a business when he came to the United States from Sweden back in uh, way back when, and uh, and my my dad and two brothers took it over, and I was in line to take that up. And so I worked in the family business for a little while, but I really wanted to do this, and I was successful with this. That was kind of family business was kind of a fallback position, and but uh, you know my better half of my my skills are related to playing music and and, and knowing how how business and finance operate, which most musicians don't know. Right. And, uh, a lot of my, <laughs> a lot of my college graduates took their engineering degree and, went and became lawyers. Right. So I've, I've got a, I've got a host of lawyers I can rely on for all kinds of different stuff. So I've, I don't know, it's, it's my wife rounds, rounds me out in just about and, and balances me in an amazing way. And, uh, to me, she's the most beautiful creature to ever walk the planet. And even though she's not hundred percent, I, I've, I want to be by her side as much as I can and touring makes it impossible to, to go back and forth and still have energy, make a big private jet back and forth, but I would be broke, you know, not, yeah, and probably not making any money. Um, and, uh, and my wife hates me taking private jets, so I've stopped doing it. But, uh, in any event, she's, she's, she's my balance and she's got her, she was a Hendrix fan. She's, uh, she, she loves, so much of the music that I love, and uh, so we're um, we're I don't know I'm I'm a happy guy and love doing what I do, and uh, my better half is uh, is there, and I don't know how I got on that tangent, but I don't know, but that's um, really really touching, JY, to to know that that probably throughout this whole craziness since 1972, you've had some kind of grounding where you've always been able to know who you are. Well, I mean, I had a sister that became quadriplegic when he was, she was in her mid twenties and she had just gotten married and the husband hung around for a while, but then he eventually flew the coop. Right. And, and my mother took her back home and, uh, my mother lived to be 98 years old and, and my mother took care of my quadriplegic sister for 25 years. I mean, she had to, we brought hired help in and whatever, but my mom, particularly as she got older, couldn't, couldn't do it all. Right. But, it, uh, you know, that's, that's the example that was set for me and my family. So when my better half when she had a stroke now about 12 years, 13 years ago and, and lost the use of her right arm and she was a righty. Um, but we've adapted. And so I, I just like to be there, let her see that I'm strong and alive and there. And I want, I want her who is, she, she's really been my rock throughout this whole thing. Yeah. She's, <laughs> I walk out the front door. She goes, "You're not wearing that, are you?" I said, "Okay." <laughs> well, she has a tremendous sense of style, and, and I'm I'm lacking there. But she, she's the one that dresses me funny. So, well, that's good. <laughs> um, you guys, you guys are out for a while. Speaking of like not wanting to be gone for too long from her side, you guys are, and and I noticed that a lot of these dates are 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 rescheduled, even some of them even twice. I think the show that you're doing here at Nutty Brown has been rescheduled twice because of the pandemic and all the things that are going on. 
You guys are out on the road for a while, but you're feeling good. You sound great on those videos I saw. Well, the um, we've got a couple of weeks. We've, we've been sort of going strong here for the last six, eight weeks. And now we've got about a two-week break coming up. We have one show in the middle of it, but it's in the Chicago area, so it'll be easy for me. And uh, I'll just be, you know, just go back home that same night, probably. Or I don't know, well, maybe I won't go home the same, but I'll be gone one night. We've got about a full two weeks at home, and then I'm going to, that'll be, um, the voices will be rested. Yeah. Um, what have you, and uh, we'll get a chance to sort of rebalance the machine and uh, go back at it again. Yeah. Well, um, congratulations on this new record. You guys really, like, it's inspiring to get to see artists that are a few, you know, a decade or so ahead of you uh, doing still creating, you know what I mean? Cause a lot of times in, in, in artists as, as, as they get older, they lose that edge to create and to, to hear an album that's, that's so great with so much passion and, and still so much excitement to make music. It's pretty amazing. Well, I mean, the, the credit goes to Tommy and Lawrence in a big way. And it goes to Todd. I mean, Ricky Phillips is no damn slouch. That guy's a rock star. Yeah, and uh, I've started calling him Cool Hand Luke. He just—he looks like a rock star. He's—he's he's a great bass player. Um, Chuck, uh, to Chuck's credit, you know, it's obviously a lot of illness issues, but he comes out and uh, sits in, and sometimes we'll have two bass players on stage, which is—I don't know—that you, you can get away with. I've seen other bands that do that. Yeah. It's pretty rare, but um, you know, we just have a—we have a great sense of family. Here and uh, I mean, Tommy and I have had our ups and downs, but it's 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 the uh, I don't know this the whole thing is working. Yeah, and so don't mess with it. No, no, don't. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. It's also it does it does it speaks volumes that you guys have really not had many members change. I mean, you've had some significant changes. And at one point you guys called it quits, but got back together. But the fact of the matter is that since you reunited in the 2000s or whatever, since, since Lawrence got in the band, it's essentially been the same band. Essentially it has been. And, uh, you know, I've, one thing I preach to everyone I talk to about, well, I can this. I said, flexibility and adaptability. Change is the only constant in the world, in the universe. And some, something's going to change your mind about this four months from now. But let's, let's, you know, let's, let's try and adapt here. Let's not freak out. We can, we can, we can manage everything. We just take a deep breath and, and, and back up a little bit and take a long look at it and say, well, what if we did this, you know, just move a few chess pieces around the board and, and, and go back at it again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, uh, I won't keep you. I know we're nearing the end of our, our thing, but uh, for those of you, I'm based in Austin here, so people can see you guys Saturday, October 23rd at the Nutty Brown Amphitheater, or uh, if you live in the San Antonio area, Sunday, October 24th at Floors Country Store. Both great places. I've played them both. I love them. Sounds great. Yeah, man. Thank you so much, and uh, I wish you a lot of luck and success. My pleasure. Uh, nice talking to you. Thanks. Nice talking to you, buddy. Okay. I know. James J.Y. Young from Styx. How cool was that? That was awesome. Check out their record, Crash of the Crown, out now. Fantastic fucking record. Fantastic record. Their most prog record yet. Super Styx sounding. They hit it. They hit the nail on the head. If you live in Austin, see them on Saturday, October 23rd at Nutty Brown Amphitheater. And if you live in San Antonio, Sunday, October 24th at Flores Country Store. If you live somewhere else, go to sticksworld.com. Their tour dates are on there. Their stuff is all on there. And uh, I really had a great time talking to JY. That was really exciting. Very exciting. (laughs) Uh, Those of you that are new to the show, I I put out like two or three shows a week. You can go through our archives by going to howdidigethere.podbean.com. And, uh, and you can scroll down the right-hand column through months and years from the last decade. All of the interviews I've done, you can, uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all kinds of places. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the show. It means a lot. You know, means a lot. 
Hope you guys have a great, great week, whatever it is you're doing. I want to thank James J. James J. Y. Young for coming on the show again. Sticks, baby. Get their album, Crash of the Crown. Go see if they're coming to a town near you at sticksworld.com. Craig Schilling, if you listen to this to the end of it, I love you, man. You're one of my best friends in the whole world. And I talked to James J. Y. Young on the phone. Call me. I'll tell you all about it. All right. Love you guys. Thank you for listening to the show. Have a great week. Let's get down. <laughs> Oh,